and welcome back everybody from the break for oh, one more session today and it's nice to be back i was looking forward to this session for days maybe first we can introduce who we are our background our relation maybe to this topic then then we will tell you how you can participate in this and we will also tell you what this is about and how we will spend the last well, one hour, 15 minutes of this today's uh, workshop session. So maybe I can start. So my name is Hadvan Bast, University of Chomzo in Norway. My background and relation to this topic is that, so I come from computational chemistry, started really doing programming in during the PhD. I got really interested in sharing code and reusing code maybe 10 years ago. And although I, 10 years ago, I thought that licenses and the concepts of sharing and free software was maybe a little bit boring and not important. Today, I think that it's not boring at all. It's super interesting and it's very important. More about it soon. And oh, I'm really excited to discuss this session with Hande. Oh, so maybe tell us uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, thanks, Radovan. Uh, so my name is Hande Celikanet. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in University of Helsinki, Finland. Uh, my background is uh, computer science and in particular machine learning and these days I'm working on uh, language technology, uh, particularly learning of language models. Uh, the importance of this topic for me, it's very near and dear to my heart uh, from, from a long time. Uh, so I, I basically <laughs> I basically took the chance to share ideas with you and then bounce them with Rodawan and I'm really looking forward to the session as well. Wonderful, really nice to have you here. And so now I'm maybe sharing screen, but so I can take the screen share. And let me tell you, let us tell you how you can participate in this, how you can find the, the session. So on top of the HackMD, there is a link to the, to the material. We will keep both the HackMD, sorry, not I should use HackMD, I should use the collaborative document. We will keep both the collaborative document and the lesson, lesson material open. Uh, how can you participate? So good news for all the exercise leads, you can, relax a little bit. There won't be any group exercises, but we still want to engage everybody, but now through the collaborative document. So everybody can interact. Please overwhelm us with questions. The more questions, the better it will be. There won't be any breakout room sessions, no individual exercises. We really want to collaborate now all together. And what is this about? What are we going to discuss? I will readjust a little bit the windows. There will be three main topics. We will talk about the social side of coding. It, it doesn't have to be an individual uh, profession, especially in, in the academic setting where we, we have to publish and share. So how do we do that in a, in a nice way? How can we collaborate in a nice way? Uh, we will talk about software licenses and and why they are so really important for all of us here. And also about how how can we cite software? We we know how to cite papers, but how can we cite software? How can we make our software citable? How can we say cite other people's software? Okay. Both Hande and me have the HackMD, sorry, the collaborative document open. We are looking at your input. We are looking at questions coming in. We have copied a couple of questions to get you started. So if I now go into social coding, there are a couple of starting questions to set the stage. So question one, and you find it in the document. Actually, let's verify that you can find it in the document. So if I scroll all the way down, they should be copied here. Here they are. So question one was, what are what could be the reasons for you to share your script, code, or data? And we have a couple of 
reasons and you can choose many and you can vote by adding this little o character and then we get we get this um text poll um question two well, when you when we share code software scripts it's sometimes scary sometimes we are concerned so what is the most concerning thing for me in this case choose one Okay, and later when we discuss these topics, we will come back to these questions. So this is really nice that you vote. It's really nice to see, yeah, the, the answer B is very often winning because we are we don't want to show something unfinished, ugly. It's not great yet. Wait one moment. So question three. Why is software often treated differently than papers? And here, please answer free form. And we will come back to these comments. And also, question for when when you go on GitLab, GitHub, you search the internet, you look for a library that does something that you want to do, that you want to plot, or you want to compute, and then you find you find the code, and you find a library, and you are thinking about hmm, should I should I use this? Or should I use the other one? So what are the things that you look at? So how do you decide before before committing? This is also really interesting for us to hear. And then please keep your questions coming. And please continue answering. We will now we will come back to these. Mm -hmm. I will advance the screen below these questions. And let's get this started. OK, and I wanted to maybe start with this image. Um, just adjusting windows here so that I see everything. So I find it interesting to compare how we, how we share papers, how we share our publications, and how we share our codes, and that is so different or is it that was this one question i think it is different and one difference is that so we sh we share our publications and then we hope that oh what happened here um okay i lost the document but the what it will return so when we share our publications we actually hope that uh, other people pick it up that they that they reuse it and that by doing so they cite my work but what what we want is we want maximum visibility maximum reuse um, the more interesting stuff is done the better for me and i think nobody is really trying to limit the reach of their manuscripts we want we wish it was all open access and we wish anybody could access it and anybody could cite it and it's different with software, or is it? So what is different there here when we share software? Does it feel differently? Uh, I, I think that's a really good question. So we are typically not, in a sense, like afraid of sharing papers. Uh, we want them to be visible. I mean, apart from the career const <laughs> concerns, of course. But we actually want them to be visible. We have done something. It's in a good condition. Uh, we think it would be more impactful. I think that there is nothing nicer for a scientist than finding their papers cited so, so many times. It really gives a deep satisfaction and happiness that you have done something useful, amazing. It's so yeah. If if it is such a such a good, clearly good feeling, then uh, how is it how is it different with code? And uh, there are some constraints definitely there are some concerns sorry uh that are a bit more uh, slightly different uh so yeah for like for example this um this um second question i think is like i'm jumping to the second one but it is somehow related no you mean uh the question two or this one here the que or... quest I, I was thinking of question two actually so, Question two. Yeah, the most yeah. concerning thing for me, and maybe we yeah. should 
maybe we should go to that one soon and have a look. Yeah, what, maybe what I'm jumping are. a little bit too much, or maybe in a in a bit more. Yeah. But let's, I mean, let's take that up. I think that's a good good transition because I think this relates a little bit. Or I don't know. That that's how sometimes I felt. So I share my code, and of course I want citations, but will they matter? Or if I put them on my CV, so that's a, that's a good question. Mm. Uh, also, I want maybe maybe other projects can pay back by uh, sharing their improvements, which I can reuse. Mm. So hopefully there is a mechanism for that. But what I sometimes felt is, well, I did all of this groundwork, and and they get they they get to do all this interesting science, and will they cite me? Will it? Uh, Maybe my code is really hidden under this house or under these castles, and nobody will even know that that they use it. And I mean, they will get all these interesting papers, and they will get they will get hired to these interesting positions. But I won't. Mm -hmm. And let's let's return to that when. So maybe let's focus soon on the question too. Um, I just want to make sure that this matches the flow that I imagined. Mm -hmm. So that I don't scroll too much mm -hmm. here, just a sec. Well, I mean, uh, questions two and one are also very related, of course. So uh, what are the particular motivations? Mm -hmm. And then what are the fears that make these motivations maybe less clear or uh, less easy to decide for us? So one can as well start with, so what is what is really the motivation in sharing my code? Um, mm -hmm. apart from like, you have a good point here, of course, there is like, um, it's now becoming more and more clear that, uh, there's a very certain incentive towards sharing code for publishing. Uh, it's, it is becoming important as a means of proving your, uh, reproduct reproducibility, mm -hmm. um, reliability, uh, and such things. So it, it is important when we are trying to publish to share the code, but that's that's not all. Like uh, there is some external motivation towards doing that, but there are also, uh, I think, like just internal motivations, uh, mm -hmm. things that basically benefit us um, to towards that as well. So yeah, we yeah. we can also start. Uh, Let's start with the motivations, and so there are journals have policies, and we we quote some of these here, and we link them. Um, they have policies with respect to data and code. Is is data treated the same way as code these days? What's your opinion there? Mm. Like publishing data, publishing code, mm. is it the same way? Mm -hmm. So I think it's not the same yet. Um, so I think maybe 20 years ago, it was still all right to say, or maybe 10 years ago, it was still okay to say data available upon request. That becomes it becomes less and less accepted, but I think today it's still sometimes okay to say code is available upon request. So like the, I think code is a little bit behind, but journals are catching up. Of course, it's a process. It requires a lot of training. That's where that's why we are here, and it will take time. But I believe that at some point it will be it will be natural to share results, data, and code. And there will be mechanisms for it, and there will be credit for it. So let's look at the motivation. So what are the benefits? What are what is motivating you? Let's scroll back to question answer one. What did you vote for? Uh, there is good support for easier to find and re reproducible code. Uh, mm -hmm. I I see a lot of support in the more trustworthiness. Uh, yes. Which is very important, of course. If you are the only one checking your own code, then then it's very very difficult to find find bugs. Um, yes, uh, also good for your CV. Yes. You got a lot of votes because you can show what you have done. Because maybe later, well, uh, the hiring committee may or may not look at this. But what if you what if you go to a startup? What if you go to a software mm -hmm. company? Then it's nice to show what you did. Also, Jay, you can reuse your own code later after changing job or affiliation. This one here. Mm. So direct benefit, and sometimes people actually do forget about that, and that's 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 something very important to keep in mind. So you are opening your code not only to other people but also your future self at the same yeah. time. Yes, and this is a real thing. So I have 
in I have relatively recently programmed the same thing twice from scratch because I was not allowed to to look at the code that I wrote earlier because of license issues. And I, I bet it took months or something like that. Yes. <laughs> and it didn't feel right yes. to me. Yes. I so uh, so we want so it, it is really important. What else? It, it, we have some couple of points. It it can enable derivative work. We will come back to that. So more academic impact. Yes, this is this is the point. Not locking yourself out of your own code. Maybe attracting others. Um, more engagement from community, maybe possibly even industry. If if it's about to become really big, it it really almost cannot become a standard if it's not open. I think this also nicely connects to the discussion in the previous session. But let's. It's not. It's sometimes scary, and um, I we wanted to pick up some of the points. But let's first see what what has won here. What are the main? Uh, there's a lot of support towards uh, exposing the ugly code, and yeah. I, I I share that. I understand that completely. Very very natural here, of course. Yes, so it's exposing ugly code, and let's talk about it a bit. And also worried about licensing legal matters, but that's why we are here. So yes. maybe let's focus on this one. Um, we don't need to read all of the other points. So what is it? Um, so maybe it's maybe it's comforting to know that you are not alone. I think everybody feels that. Um, it's also maybe comforting to know that software is never finished. It will never be perfect. It will never be done. Software, when if, if, when we think it's finished and we put it somewhere, it slowly decays. And why is it why is it so? Because there are dependencies, and dependencies they move forward, and and our operating system evolves. And just try to run something that you wrote ten years ago. And, and again, this was this was a nice discussion in the previous session, the 10 years challenge. So as soon as we put it somewhere, it's it, it needs to be maintained. If it needs to be kept alive, it's never finished. It's never perfect. But also the the other thing that may be comforting is that nobody, hopefully, in practice, nobody will judge. Everybody feels everybody's in the same boat. But. I also want to scroll down a little bit here because I added this box on. Oh, well, well, maybe it relates to it. Maybe it doesn't. No, that was a little bit a different point. It was the point uh, C. No, sorry. It was the point D. I will get too many questions, but that is actually not such a big concern. All right, no, change of plan. I, didn't, I don't want to. Um, what else is well? Maybe I do want to pick it up because that's a. It's something that, mm. at least, I feel a lot. Yes, and that's something that is, I think, very important to be aware of. I, uh, at least, think it's important for everyone to know that this may be an issue and it may need some dealing with like going going prepared mentally yeah and it really is a little bit to the <clears throat> sharing something unfinished and also what if what if people then want improvements from me they, they ask a lot of questions a lot of issues pull requests and it can become a problem um you aren't required to support anybody just by sharing the code <clears throat> So you can also archive the repository and disable things like issue pull requests. What, what can also help a lot is to put a note into README and say that, well, I wrote this in 2020 and it was a really fun project back then, but now I'm working on other things. I'm, I don't have time to support it, but if somebody wants to maintain this, then please contact me and I will give you access and please take this from me, no problem. However, uh, this is not so easy, I think. Just saying that you are not required to support anybody is not so easy. Maybe you have experience and implicit expectation of support. Mm -hmm. It can lead to overwork, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Also saying that, well, I just don't support requests can induce guilt. Mm -hmm. 
if you look around, um, most projects that we do are maintained by one or two people, really. Yeah. And there are many other people who join them, maybe for one pull request, the occasional. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So a couple of like main contributors and a lot of people potentially using and wanting things, maybe uh, adding one change there, adding maybe one more there, but so many. And mm -hmm. it does need to be maintained. Uh, yeah. I mean, if it's if it's that much. Yes, and there is this wonderful book by Nadia Astarohova and link is further below, who compares casual contributors, like tourists visiting New York City for a weekend. I mean, they, they are interested in the city, they participate for a short while, but they are maybe not interested in participating in local elections and local policies and uh, improving the situations on, on the metro, etc. So there's a difference. And if you, if you maintain all the projects that you ever start, well, at some point you will not be able to start new projects. And maybe you have experienced this this is a wonderful book, uh, Working in Public, The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software. Highly recommend. I just want to catch up here with questions. I will keep an eye. Um, let's also come back to what was the, it was the question number, that was question number four. When you find a repository with code you would like to reuse, what are the things you look at before you use it? How easy is it to run? Do we understand it? What are the license requirements? Wonderful, great. Mm -hmm. What is the community around it? Is it used by other people? How quickly can I test some proof of concept? So how quickly is it to get started? Yes. You want to get started in like 10 minutes. You don't want to spend two weeks on, on this code. Uh, repository activity. How many stars? When was it last modified? Was it modified three years ago? And, and we have this listed here. So what you have indicated is also what we thought of. Uh, how is the versioning? Are, are there open pull requests are issued? Are they followed up? Is it difficult to install? Is it difficult to get started? But when, of course, when we look at the code date of last change and we will look at are there open pull requests, we should also remember the what we just said two minutes ago is that yeah. just because the person stopped coding it two years ago doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that the person is not interested. It may not be that it may be that the person doesn't have time. It can still be a good project. It can still be working, and it can still be worthwhile to pick it up and contribute to it. Okay, there is a little bit more. Again, yes, trust and community. That's a great point. And I think we are doing okay with time. I think so too. Uh, we are getting some nice questions. Mm -hmm. And we also have question three to talk about maybe how, so question three, why is software often treated differently from papers? Uh, would you like to go through that first and then come back to the questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is, there are some old structures sometimes like theory looks down on engineering. Mm. Sometimes one academic discipline looks down on the other, other academic discipline. It's really pity. It's pity that we don't collaborate. It mm. having a high profile manuscript publication seems to matter a lot more than having a code that is used by many other codes. Still. Good point. Scientific originality. Mm -hmm. Uh, we citing code is mm, how to reference code, how to cite code. It's not taught. It's hopefully we can clarify it, but it's it's a new thing. Yeah, indeed. How to even publish code? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a very good point. And how to have a career on coding in academia? Like, how can you 
how can you create an academic track record based on publishing code? So that's a mm -hmm, interesting, uh, traditionally considered to be a method, not a research output. I think this is this is now changing. It is, indeed, but a good point. Indeed, historic indeed. reasons. Yeah. Um, it's again, it's software people, technical people. It's not sometimes not considered research. This is also a great point. It's again connects that software is never really done. I mean, a, a manuscript is done. We we write it and we publish it, and it's done. I mean, maybe maybe then there is a there is a correction or something, but the but software needs to be continually maintained. Maybe it doesn't fit really into the idea that we can finish it and publish it. It also doesn't fit into the idea of, of funding applications because many funding proposals. I'm getting signal here that I'm offline. Am I still here? Ah uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Good. Um, so in fund the funding applications, there is also this assumption. Well, we have this idea. We will write the code, and then it's done, and then the money stops, and then what? <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Everything is so uh, transitionary in a sense. We are used to thinking and working in terms of two, three year projects, and then jumping onto new ideas because it needs to continue. Uh, and it is very established how we can do this with uh, papers, as as the answers mentioned. The, it's straightforward. We know how to, but it's not very established how we can do that with with code. And we are just learning as a community. We are finding out. And and again, great points about career development, funding opportunities. So these are things that. Unfortunately, it still matter. We hope that this is, this will change. Um, maybe like a little bit, you know, if you join this session a little bit later, like in a television show, uh, the best way to participate is to ask lots of questions and give lots of comments on the collaborative document. There will not be any group exercises. You can also have lunch or dinner at the same time, depending on your time zone. I'm having my coffee at the same time, so quite a Me too. <laughs> Coffee number two in front of me. So before before closing this episode, um, I wanted to show you this image here. And the idea is not mine, only the handwriting is mine. And the idea here is that, so in, in the middle, this is our work. This is what we do. Manuscripts, code, data, conda environments, everything reproducible. And a lot goes into our work. We don't work in isolation. So we get ideas from books, from other manuscripts, from colleagues in the elevator. We read articles. We, we use data. We use software written by other people, so written by others. How do we give back to them? Hopefully, we give back through citation and credit, and hopefully, they get something out of it. Um, but. At some point, we also publish and share our ideas, our articles, our data, our software to others. And again, we have the same hope that we get something out of it. Sometimes it's just a fulfillment, but hopefully it's more. I think the the core of this, why this, I find it so interesting, this idea is that, so our work always depends on the outputs from others. This is maybe relatively obvious, but, whether one day I can actually share my code and share my data depends how I got them. So whether I can share the out, my output depends on how you obtained your input. If I used software which I wasn't meant to use because license didn't allow it, if now I want to publish it three years later, now I have maybe a problem. What if the, what if the paper requires me to open what I have? Um, a repository that is private today might become public one day. I think that's really good to remember. And uh, we will come back to that in the next episode. The other thing that is very important in this picture is that here it says others, but 
others is often you yourself in the future, in a different group or in a different job, or in the same group, but maybe you're already like a year later, two years later, and you want to just re rerun what, what you did two years ago. And for all of this, software licenses matter. And this is what we will discuss. It really matters. If we don't, if we ignore software licenses, we can't really do this. And then, then it's a problem. Indeed. We need to know, uh, we need to have information. And that's also one of the concerns, one of the big concerns, I think, in the above questions. Uh, knowledge about this so yeah this definitely needs to be discussed uh there are also some some additional questions uh do we have time shall we go sure, over which them? One there, are also, I... there are also very nice answers uh so uh what about like um, they <laughs> They all seem important to me. It's very difficult to choose choose from, and and I like I very much like the answers here. Uh, like for example, what happens if if there is some kind of incident? If I I use the uh, I use a project and then suddenly like it gets removed, it's not maintained anymore, and of course like there is always a risk. Definitely, usually more contributors, less risk, but definitely possible um i guess i guess it's important to acknowledge the risk uh for sure mm -hmm. yeah i mean deleting project or uh, it's possible and that's why we want to also then deposit it on so on services like zenodo so it gets a persistent identifier and it doesn't get lost accidentally or willingly yeah um people leaving the project is is a risk from the like group leader or department perspective. And I think they need to plan for it. And the answer is um, not to make it difficult for people to leave, mm. but to, to improve documentation or uh, learning across the group code review so that more than one person understands it. So improving the learning, improving the onboarding, improving the community. Mm. Also great questions about um, like who is who be who does it belong to what we are right here does it belong to me the university we will come back to that yes indeed uh two questions also non-commercial licenses let's mm -hmm. let's come back to that when we are discussing the licenses uh, uh there's a nice question there's a nice additional motivation that it invites uh, sharing code invites us to write code properly from the onset <laughs> i think this is a nice point really uh Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely, it's a very, very viable, uh, nice motivation. Um, yeah, like share the code in a way that you would like to find it. And it doesn't have to be perfect, really. And, and I think we should not try to make things perfect. Yeah. Uh, should we move on to next episode? Yes, maybe, yes. Mm -hmm. Time-wise, I think that's a good idea to move yeah. now. So we are still doing well here, 40 minutes to go. Mm -hmm. um, I click here next, but this is then now we we want to talk a little bit more about licensing, mm -hmm. also what is derivative work because yes. and we will try to keep it practical. So we will try not to go into legal rabbit holes, not too philosophical, really yes. practical. What does it mean for us? I what have a few questions also here mm -hmm. for you to participate. Uh, please keep adding your own questions also. Oh yeah. Uh, so wait a moment. You. Oh, there it is. Yes. Yeah. I need to show what we are doing here. So on. This is something that we will uh, away. We will come back to. Yes. And the question is, what? Which of these is derivative work? It may not be clear what is derivative work, but it is well a derivation of the original creation. And these are practical things that we often do. I don't know, finding something on on the internet and changing it and including it. So is that the derivative work? And here, choose many. And of course, you will see you will see what other people do. But it's still interesting for us to see which where are we more sure and when where are we less sure. So please vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, 
I shouldn't scroll so much. <laughs> this is this is really about the copyright. So this this episode is not we we don't talk about trademarks and we don't talk about patents. We we really here we focus on copyright. It's about creative expressions, and this is what software typically is about. Also, our manuscripts, graphics, photos, presentation slides. So this is about copyright. It it protects creative expression. It is automatically created. So when you write new code, it is automatically copyrighted to somebody. Well, the question is to whom? It can still be a good idea to put the copyright on top of the file so that there is no doubt if somebody later finds it and copies it in, into a different project and it gets copied into yet another project, it can be a good idea to add it on top. And it matters for derivative work. And derivative work is really what we do all the time because we take code from others, we change it. We take um, ideas from others, maybe not a good idea and not a good example because ideas are more maybe yeah. something that can be patented. Let's focus on code. So if we take code and change it, is derivative work or is it? I mean, that's the question now to you, but we will come back to that. And what you can do with the derivative work, like can you use it, can you share it, sell it, publish it? It depends on what the license of the code is. That's why licenses matter. And even if you completely ignore licenses, you can probably do that for quite a while, but it will become a problem once you start, once, once you are asked to publish it. Um, also, the thing with licenses is that it's typically not a concern when you start with a project and when it's only you. But I think that's the moment to think about it. Often we think about licenses once the project is already really mature and once many people and many affiliations are involved. And then it's something that is very difficult to change and very difficult to decide. So it matters late, but the later we do it, the more difficult it is to do. Let's do it early. So let's come back to your answers here. When what is what is derivative work? What is not? If you build on something, you form derivative work. What did we find out? So these were the questions, and these were the answers. Let's still the incoming answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, please vote. I will also have a look whether we missed any other question that. We should talk about. Maybe it also means that people aren't sure. Um, so a download some code from a website and add on to it. That's the relative work, yes. Even if I download the code and I only take part of it out, out and I copy one function from from a project I found on the internet into my own project, it is probably derivative work. If I take code from somewhere and I change it or extend it, or even, even completely rewriting it, and even completely rewriting it to a different programming language, so it, it doesn't look at all like the, like the original thing. Like I found something and it was written in MATLAB, and now I rewrote everything into Python. It doesn't look and I change all the variable names. <laughs> Is it still derivative work? So yes, it is. And uh, it was it was surprising to me. So I thought that no, that isn't because everything's different. There's nothing but but I based my work because I looked at the original code. I used it. I used it for testing. I it helped me when debugging. I would not be here. I would not have been able to arrive at my new Python code without having this original code. I looked at it. It is derivative work, and that's why it's good to be. So, what I should have also done before starting all of this rewrite, I should have looked: is there a license file? What is the license? And let's talk about licenses in a moment. Um, how about G and H and I linking to libraries, static or dynamic plugins and drivers typically is not derivative work. In legal, it always depends, but I would say typically not. So only 
just because I link to a math library written by, I don't know, one of these famous, one of these popular math libraries mm -hmm. does not make my code derivative work of them. Um, if, if somebody explains me the code, if I look at the algorithm, but I don't see the code itself, and then, then I write it based on the explanation and the algorithm and the ideas, then it's so-called clean room sound. This is not derivative work. So then, then the new thing is my, my creative creation. Same, this is also not derivative work, same idea. You, because here you, you read the idea, you understand the algorithm. The algorithm is not copyrighted. Indeed. So the, the coding itself, the development of the code, that is the uh, that is the property there that we are continuing from. So mm -hmm. if we use the code itself by looking at the code and looking at the code and rewriting, then it's different. Whereas if we don't have access to the code and if we are coming up with the code ourselves, then then that's another that's another matter, another issue. Yeah, and of course, nobody will force you to forget what you have seen. So sometimes it's it's difficult. But um, <laughs> but one of the first things. So when I find this code somewhere on the internet, before um, if I really want to incorporate it, I look I look at what are the license terms before I look too carefully into the source code. That makes a lot of sense, yes, indeed. Question 61, what if I only distribute a patch and tell people to apply it themselves? Is the derivative work? That's a very interesting question. I mean, then I would maybe distribute a patch and say that this is a very permissive license. You can adjust it to the license of your code. And what permissive is, uh, we will see in a very brief moment of, this relates a little bit to what we discussed before. Why might I think why derivative work might be good for you mm. is a little bit related to why sharing might be good for you. So I think, but still allowing, making it easy for others to make derivative work of your project may could be good because you might get more credit. Of course, you don't want to make it citable. And how to make it citable, we will we will discuss then towards the end of the session. Should we talk about the different licenses and how they work and what how to choose? Uh, I I think it's a good idea at least like to give brief outlines. I think that's something that confuses many people, or um, mm -hmm. maybe they make like they fall back to the default choices that they have seen from everybody without understanding its implications, maybe like, uh, even if shortly, I think it, it can be useful to discuss. But um, we have, there are many software licenses, but in practice, there are not so many. So I know maybe five to 10, and I use a handful and we will, um, we will also discuss which ones we like best and why, but this is this is actually a question other one i think it's a good one uh why do you use a handful why why not like come up by your own license to do exactly what you what you wanted to do is there is there like a downside to just great question um yes i i don't want to invent my own license and why not because because compatibility of licenses is really important and if i invent my own or I use something that nobody else is using, then it, the compatibility between licenses is unclear. And compatibility is important because when we combine, you know, I take the function from this project and I take the, the module from the other project and I take then the code base that the previous postdoc wrote, I'm combining components. And then they have to be compatible, not only in, programming wise, but they also need to be compatible license wise. So don't try to invent your own license unless you are uh, specializing in this. Take the one that exists, take a standard one, because then other people and legal teams have already figured out how they are compatible. 
and you don't have to do it and the users all don't have to do it. So use a standard license. So maybe the most important point. And here we have tried to classify them into four different categories. It's not important to remember the names, but maybe you have heard about some of these and we want to tell you what, what these categories mean. Category one is custom. Well, we don't want to do any custom. So this is home homemade license, not good because you can't do derivative work because compatibility unclear. If it's closed code, well, you can't do derivative work, obviously. If it's prop proprietary closed, so derivative work is not possible. Um, I personally try to avoid this. I know that there are academic codes that finance themselves through proprietary license and through through payment. And I don't want to judge this. This is this is how they finance their work and research and salaries. But derivative work is typically then not possible. I think derivative work is a good thing uh, because it can increase our scientific reach. Then there are permissive licenses. And maybe these are not all of them, but so there is MIT, BSD, Apache. They are very, if you find a code that has a permissive license, you can do almost anything with it. The only condition and is that you acknowledge the original author. You say where it came from. You don't, you don't remove the copyright from the previous person, but you, you add your own to it. You don't say that you invented it, but you say that, no, this is based on the code that I found. But otherwise, you can do almost anything with it. You, don't have, you can even close it. You don't have to open it up. You don't have to share your modification. Very, very liberal. I think, I think this is important to know. So you get credit, but it is, it is possible with the permissive licenses that your code can be taken and done something with and unclosed. Yes. So this is important distinction. So what if you have a code and then now a company comes or a group comes and they make it 20 times faster? Yes. You would also like to have this 20 times faster code, Indeed. but they don't have to share it with you. They, they, they may or may not. They are not forced to. They are not forced. And this is the difference between the other categories. So the, the category three and four, uh, which are so-called copyleft share alike. I think the important point is share alike, meaning that these licenses then force the derivative work to be also shared under, under a similar license. So here, if you choose one of these share alike, then you can be at least legally sure that uh, if they make it 20 times faster, they have to share these improvements and you can use these improvements yourself. So you are not locked out of the improvements towards your code. And the difference between these two, like what is the weak copyleft, strong copyleft, is that uh, whether the only the component that has, that has changed has to be shared or the whole combination has to be shared. Which one, which one is your go-to license on the, or does it depend? Probably depends. Uh, uh, well, that's a good question. It depends a lot. This is something that is always important to discuss with colleagues. Uh, their um, ideas are also, are also important. Uh, several of my colleagues like the MIT license. Uh, I tend to, tend towards the weak copyleft, uh, but it is, it is a, it is definitely something to be shared. I think at the beginning of uh, collaborative work, how, how do you want to, what, what do you want, uh, to enable with this code, uh, using a more permissive code can enable, um, can, how, how do you say incentivize, uh, mm -hmm. other people to use your code. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are things to be said about that. It is after all a softer version of requirements on them. Uh, yes, I, I think, or, or for example, like choosing the strong copyleft, it, it does 
come with strong uh, conditions, strong expectations. So only people who are really okay with these constraints are going to use your code. So it is really, I think, a matter of where you stand. What are your priorities? Uh, do you want to ensure that code openness is guaranteed? Do you want to ensure that anything that uses your code is is uh, definitely open? Uh, do you prefer, are you more rela relaxed on that to ensure more usability of mm -hmm. your code, more wide usage of your code? I, I think it's a very, very personal yeah. uh, decision. How about yourself, Radovan? Yeah, it's, it really depends. I, I like how you said, so these sound, these really sound great. And I like, I think it would be great if we share everything and we don't have to reinvent everything yeah. all the time. But yeah. in practice, um, it puts restrictions. If, if I create a library that is amazing and I would like also companies that sell code and that have maybe they are really famous in my academic field to use it, maybe I will not choose this one because this this might limit the reach because it will scare some maybe com companies away from it because they don't want to disclose all their source code. A little bit. That's also what my heart likes, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely the ideal. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's a very, very difficult question. Um, then, if I write something where I know it's it's a it's a small repository, nobody, I will not get any gold medal for it. So <laughs> it then I make it permissive because I just want to be, be as easy as possible. That makes a lot of sense to me. And then if I write something where I thought, wow, this is really cool, I want it to be used, but I want the improvements. Mm. Also, I go, I really like this one. The Mozilla public license, because then it can be incorporated even into commercial codes, um, and they don't have to share everything. They uh, they only have to share improvements to my component. Indeed. So then, so I often go between this MPL and MIT BSD. Yes, yes, yes. I understand. That's also, I think, in in practice, what I find myself going in in between. Too, I also like the MPL license because. Um, yeah, it's it's a really nice thing to get the uh, improvements to your code. I mean, yeah. When we had this discussion before before the session, you told me about it was so fascinating to learn that this is not only in software, but that yes. we share a like idea also yes. happens in in other fields. That was really yes. cool to hear about. Yes, yes, exactly. I completely forgot about that. Thanks for reminding. <laughs> this is very tangential. Uh, I play role playing games, and. Uh, the approach to role-playing games is, of course, like an artistic endeavor. Uh, so what is typically done by big companies is that they have some uh, intellectual property on the game. Uh, so you can take it, look at it, but you cannot derive from it easily. And then there is this recent movement of open source also with, with these games. And it is growing so magnificently. Uh, one of my favorite games, Blades in the Dark, that's an open source game. Uh, mm -hmm. And you are allowed to take it, change it, derive it, add to it, take the base rule set, make your own game, uh, put the name, uh, Forge in the Dark, and, and publish. Uh, and the community around that is amazing. I, I don't think in any way that has limited the uh, uh, income or the value mm -hmm. of the author if anything it has grown so much with with all the people's editions that's clearly a, something that's far far more than a single person could have achieved yeah. with all all these loving editions being added to it and it's like creating its own world becoming a big thing i think well it, it became really big in the recent years and i think a very important part of this momentum was this openness and it really improves quality, and it's it's Very cool much. to know that there is something like I don't know GitHub for for games. So that's awesome. Um, a few questions that came up. So I, I wanted to comment on question sixty-seven. It's a very interesting one. 
um, we can license code for non-commercial use. So that can be, hmm. so there is data, that there is this Creative Commons non-commercial. That's one thing we may comment on. And all of these, all of these uh, licenses, which are mentioned here, they, they are not limiting commercial, not commercial. So if you take these standard open source initiative approved licenses, they don't make any distinction there. You cannot limit commercial, not commercial with these licenses. Of course, you, take, you can take a different license, but then make sure that this is this is a commonly used standard license so that he so that again the compatibility is clear. So the compatibility can be a little bit of a problem then with if we restrict use. The idea between all of these licenses is that the software is free. Anybody can use it, change it for any anything they like to do. But somewhere here, I also think that we have a link on somewhere here on the page we have a link also on the ethical question behind licenses and because it's also about like do you want your code to be used by mm. company producing weapons uh, mm. so I think somewhere on the page I don't want to scroll too much up and down but somewhere we have a link on that if not we, we should add that also what was something we, that we have but we will not go through but it could be amusing is that we have this slide deck which tries to explain these different licenses with the analogy of a cake recipe. So if you like later, you can go through the slide deck and hopefully it will be helpful to make these concepts clear. We have now 15 minutes left. Um, a few more concepts to talk about. Ownership uh, yeah, is important because cool. ownership, so who, who owns the code that we write? It depends. Um, it, it, it often typically is the, in the academic setting, often it's the institute, the university. It depends on the country. Uh, if it's a company, it's typically the company. Um, sometimes even it can even reach into what you write in your free time. Fortunately, not, not in universities. Um, it is the owner who can change a license. And now you can already see that as the project is growing, there are more and more owners, and they need to then all agree. So changing license is possible. It's more and more difficult the later it is in the project. But if you own it, you can change it. Um, if you don't own it, you can request a transfer of ownership. This is often not very well defined within universities. So universities, they on one hand, they implicitly own what you write. On the other hand, they want to encourage open science. It can be a little bit tricky. It often doesn't matter. and It only matters once the project gets really gigantic and once a lot of money is involved. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, it's good. We talked about last week, we talked about code review pull requests. Here, it's good to look at, like if somebody sends you 5,000 lines of code, mm -hmm. where does the code come from? Is this is this, has the person written it or has the person copied it from somewhere? Um, and not to be suspicious or anything, but it's just good to know that whatever I incorporate will affect just the license integrity of my project. Let's keep it practical here. Oh, let's not get too, too philosophical. What are the practical recommendations? Practically, we cannot ignore it. Think about it early. It's difficult to give a clear, like use this license or that license, but what I recommend is discuss with your students or with your supervisor or with your colleagues very early in the project. It is important from day one. I often start, uh, when I start a new repository, I, I often start with a readme and a license file. There is nothing there yet, but then it also means that I don't need to ask anybody because I can just license my readme file and then I can add on top of it. Uh, you, if you want to find out which one is the right license, there are tools that can help you. This one can even, I think it can even send you a pull request with a license file once you choose. Uh, 
a fantastic resource to find out what should be in my readme file is our review criteria for the Journal of Open Source Software. There are other great resources that can help you with other files because it's we talked about community. It's also good to have a documentation on how people can contribute, what is the code of conduct. If you know about other resources that we should list here, we would love to hear. Yes, make take a standard license. Don't, don't invent your own. Don't design your own. Uh, make sure you don't lock yourself out. Take the keys with you when you leave your apartment. So make the code open. <laughs> this is a fantastic advice. And I'm grateful to Enrico for sharing it. Even if it's still private and we still didn't publish it, nobody can see it. It's good to work in, in the repository as if it was public, because one day it will become public. 10 years later, it will become public. And then it's nice if you can release the entire Git history, not only the latest snapshot. <laughs> and But then we will start doing archaeology. Oh, how did we get this commit? Oh, how did we get that file? <laughs> now we need to start removing it. That sounds difficult. <laughs> Yeah, and I've been through through this in at least two projects where we then <laughs> went and start try to oh. remove things that shouldn't be there. <laughs> I see. Oh, uh, there was a question about data and Creative Commons. So the software licenses you mentioned they are for typically for software. Then there is also Creative Commons, which is typically for data, data sets, images. The same classification exists as well. So there is. The, the more permissive ones, and then there are the more uh, share-like ones. Is that so? So there is Creative Commons attribution, which would be roughly corresponding to MIT BSD. There is also, there is a Creative Commons non-commercial. How is there anything share-like in Creative Commons that forces you to Maybe. Oh, yeah. CCSA share alike, yes. Okay. Uh, let's have a quick look here. Is that true what I'm saying? Well, now, of course, I don't recognize this website, but the I think there is one called SA. Yes, that's the one share alike. Mm -hmm. So that would be roughly equivalent to this Mozilla public license GPL. Now we have 10 minutes left. <laughs> what to do? Should we? Maybe we can talk about site, citable code. This can be done later in the some other day on a rainy day. Go through these questions. We also have a solution. We also have a lot of further reading recommendations on really great books, great blog posts where you can find out more. But maybe let's use the last 10 minutes and go to the final episode here and talk about citing software and here i want to reconnect to the previous lesson and we have maybe seen this image fair principles findable accessible and two other principles so how about findable and accessible if i put my code on github is this publishing is this enough it's good to do but uh, and to put it out there with the license, but is it enough? And that is what is so commonly done these days, isn't it? It is yeah. It is the go-to. This is what we kind of know, we have seen. We put our code on GitHub and GitLab, and we publish it. And we mainly think that is, that's, that's quite enough. Job done. Yeah, and, and of course it's good. But it's not enough in the long term. It's not enough in the 10 years perspective. Because what if I delete my GitHub account and with it all the repositories? Uh, also, will it, will... also, we have no guarantee that GitHub is going to be around. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So what if many services came and went? Yes. So we exactly. want to have a persistent identifier, a digital object identifier in addition. Uh, there are many services. We have seen one of them earlier. So one of the go-to services for software is Zenodo. Also, please use the remaining nine minutes to give us feedback about today. Mm -hmm. 
So thanks, thanks a lot for putting this out here on, on the collaborative document. Okay. One question that is good to ask is, well, what if I want to publish something that is mainly software and not so much mainly research? Is, are there good papers for it? And there is a, there is a very nice list. Great summary on journals that, that welcome, sometimes specialize on, on software contribution. I want to maybe highlight, if I had to highlight one, it would be the Journal of Open Source Software, where, where also the review is actually public. And the review is happening on GitHub. So these journals exist, but there are many more, also depending on your discipline. Question 73, will Zenodo snapshot on GitHub survive? Yes, it will, because Zenodo makes a copy of it. So even if, again, if GitHub pulls the plug, it will still be on servers that are financed by the European Union. How, how can we make our code citable? How can we collect all these citations so that we, in a couple of years, oh, it will matter on our CVs? And I mean, question to ask you and your colleagues and your friends, how do you cite software now? And if I wanted to now go and, how many people are watching right now? I don't know. If I wanted to cite your, your code, what would I need to do? Is it easy? Is, it, is there any instruction? Would I have to contact you? Can I find it in the readme? And here is a checklist. And the checklist is not, I didn't invent it. This is from this nice, Citation checklist for developers published on Zenodo. Few things they should always be there to make your software citable. There should be a license. Describe the software using an appropriate metadata format. And one of them, one of these, the one that we recommend is this citation file format, a little bit further below, so that not only humans can find and access it, but also machines and registries, there should be a clear version number. Make sure that all the authors are credited. Make sure you got a digital object, object identifier. And also add, add a recommended citation in your documentation so that people who find your code, all they have to do is they copy paste this into their manuscript and then they will do it. I think if it's easy, I would, I would do it. So practically speaking, get a DOI on Zenodo. Um, make it as easy as possible. And I talked about this metadata format. And one that became standard is the so-called citation file format. Here's an example. And here you can find out more about this. And with this, you can tell this is a machine readable, you know, who are the authors and their orchids. And all of these, the checklist is here. What is nice about this format is that GitHub supports it. And if you have this in your repository, then you can, there, there will be a button. And I wish I could show it now, but the, it will show how, how can I cite this code. So please add this to your repositories. And sometimes you need, you want to cite other people's code. There are great resources on this. Like what are software to citation principles? I, I highlight here only four, but there are more, but I really recommend having a look at these. Um, these are the one things that you should mention when you cite other people's code. And if you are curious about, well, which format should I use? There are also examples in this paper. Let's have a quick peek into the paper. So in the paper, you can find Scroll, scroll, scroll. There are also, this is tiny font, but there are software citation examples. So please have a look at this. We have now less than five minutes left. Um, what did we forget? What should we, what would we like to clarify before we close the show for today? I'm looking at the questions.
Maybe I can also answer the questions that I asked. Well, is my code easily citable? I admit that, well, not all of them, no. I think what I really want to do is to go into these projects at the citation CFF file, and I want to add one line into the readme how to cite it. It can be good for the CV, but it's also nice, to, like once you start, once you make it citable, you can actually search for like who is citing my code. It can be fun to find, to find out in a couple of years who is actually using it and for what. It can be motivating. What should we, where did I go too fast? <clears throat> Should I go back to the practical recommendations from the end of this just to keep it open here? Um, here, no, sorry, here. Uh, this may be a bit tangential, Radovan, but should we talk about changing licenses? How, uh, how practical it is. You have a code that you gave some kind of license some years mm -hmm. ago. Now you have changed your mind on that. Yeah. So how does it work? What do we need to do if you want to change license? If it's if it's yourself, if it's one single person, nobody ever committed anything else, it's just me. Well, maybe I should ask the university, but if it's a tiny, tiny project, I, I might just change it. If we are <clears throat> often over time, we are more people. And then everybody who has contributed needs to agree to it. So I need to then reach out to everybody. I need to find out who are the contributors. And maybe the contributors are not all enlisted in the Git history. So maybe some, some have contributed and didn't do a Git commit. We need to find them. We need to reach out to all, to all of them. And we need to get an agreement. Unless, so there are more formal ways. There is this contribution. What is the name? or contribution or something agreement. So there are formal ways to formalize it, but this is relevant to really only large projects, I think. Contributor license agreements. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you could also, yeah. yeah. So you could ask people to kind of sign it when they send a pull request, but but I wouldn't start with this because this, this could then scare people away to, from contributing because they don't want to run it by the legal department before uh, fixing a typo. But it is relevant for a big projects. Bigger scale projects, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. We have very little time left. Feedback very much appreciated. Let us know. Please vote here. Was it too fast? Was it too slow? Both sessions of today. Um, what is it? The one thing that was good, we should keep and do more of what was the one thing that we should improve change for tomorrow and next time. Please let us know. Now I'm sharing HackMD for the feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe I can still comment on seven, question 74. If I use somebody else's code under GPL, what do I need to do other than adhering to the standards, which means also then publishing my code under GPL? It would be not to remove their contributions. So there will be there is somewhere copyright to the original author. Below that, I would add, I would clarify what are the what are the changes that I did. This is not necessary, but it's it's nice to to see what uh, what are the modifications and the modifications are then copyright the new the new copyright owner. Um, it can either be on top of the modified file. It can also be summarized in the readme or in the documentation. Question 75, when you have a repository that has multiple types of things in it, um, I guess you could very well have different types of licenses for different types of data in there, like the graphics and so on. Mm -hmm. um, often for small enough projects, I'll just use the same license for everything, but 
but I also do. Uh, this is not exactly the question, but I oh, mm. I found it. So this is something I would. I'm telling. I, I wish I could tell my younger self, is that if I find a nice image on the internet, or an idea, or a quote, that I also write down. Now I always write a little readme next to it, and I write where did I get this from, under which license, because then one year later when I then want to publish what I have, or then I at least I remember where it came from and I remember the license. Yeah. Please, there's a lot of people online and not much feedback. Please answer the feedback poll. Otherwise, we won't know how to change things. Yep, please let us know. And I think we are basically out of time. I, yeah. I hope that you had fun. I had lots of fun. Thanks to Hande for for co-teaching this with me. This Thank was you very much for the discussions. It was very good fun for me also. Super fun. And please keep the questions coming on so question 74 and following, and we will answer those. Maybe it will be a little bit later in the afternoon. We also need to catch up with lunch, but uh, we will come back to those. And then you can archive also the, the answers. Yeah. OK. So I guess we will leave the feedback here for a bit and mm -hmm. see you tomorrow. The same time we start 10 minutes before the hour with the discussion and icebreakers and answering any remaining questions. And then we do what's it, Jupiter and documentation. Mm -hmm. So Jupiter is a little bit less about the really basics of Jupiter and more about what we show you some advanced kind of tricks and other things. And then documentation is, well, you see, you get the introduction, not just to some concepts, but how you build different documentation sites, like including our lessons and how you can build it with GitHub, which is really cool and a good introduction for Friday. So yes, see you tomorrow then. See you tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.